You will be amazingly shocked to find out that the barriers they have in prison are the same barriers they have coming out of corporate America about Bitcoin. Welcome back to the Compass Mining Podcast. Today I am joined by Justin Redrick. Justin is an author, an educator, and a Bitcoiner. And today we're going to hear his story, talk about his book, and talk about what he's doing currently for Bitcoin and in Bitcoin. Justin, how you doing? Thanks for joining. What's going on, man? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on here. It's a pleasure to be here. Lovely. Yes. Thank you for coming on. People don't know this. We've had some technical difficulties, but we're working through. And as Bitcoiners, we are resilient. So we're going to keep this thing moving forward. Um, Justin, and I know you've done this a thousand times. Uh, you're an educator. And myself, I worked as kind of an educator in rural communities in Central America and South America for many years. Many people maybe don't know that about me here on this podcast. And every time I would go into a room, a brand new room where people didn't know me, I would have to say what my name is, where I'm from, and kind of give a little bit about reason why I'm in that room. And so I know you've done this a thousand times. If you could just talk about your life and what, you know, what, what obviously inspired the book uh, Bars to Bitcoin. But if you could just start and talk to us about that, that'd be great. All right, man. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, uh, again, I want to say thanks for having me on here. Compass. I don't care what no one says. You all are a great company. You've been good to me, um, even with the documentary. But for me, my journey into Bitcoin came. Sometimes I say it happened when I came home from prison, but it might have happened way earlier before I even before Bitcoin was a thing. Uh, what really made me a stone cold Bitcoiner, as you all know, I've gone to prison. I've come home from prison and learned about Bitcoin and. I've I've studied, I've taught other people, I've traded Bitcoin, lost Bitcoin, spent Bitcoin. I've been all up and down. Uh, but the thing that really got me into Bitcoin was when I was a high a senior in high school and I, my mother and I, our house was foreclosed on and we didn't have anywhere to go. We I was homeless that year. Um I had a lot of I had a crazy senior year of high school. We foreclosed, we lost our house to foreclosure. I witnessed a friend of mine get murdered. Um, I went to college and still dropped out of college. As I look back on it, I just was, I feel like I wasn't mentally ready for college, plus the financial obligations that's there and that was at home. It just, it just made me think I wasn't ready for college. I did a lot of partying, smoking weed, drinking liquor, chasing girls instead of keeping my head in the books. So if you're a young kid out here, even if you like Bitcoin, don't want to go to college, at least keep your head in the books and study Bitcoin. Uh, but from there, I had come home and was desperate for money. And so I was hanging out with some folks and we decided to try to go rob a guy for some money. And it didn't go well. It didn't go well at all. Matter of fact, no, it went great. Uh, it went real great. Cause I got caught in with the prison. I did three years in prison from the age of 21 to 24. And when I came home, I just knew I wanted to do something different. I wanted to, I didn't know I wanted to be an early adopter or something. I didn't know that was the actual word, but I knew that something good was going on in the world that if I was just there early, people would not have to look at my background. They it would almost be either uh, an accelerant or just something they overlooked because I had certain information and knowledge that others didn't. And um, that, that scenario actually came way of Bitcoin. I heard about Bitcoin from this guy I knew and uh, he told me about it. I was, you know, kept studying it, looking it up, reading it, reading it. And I said, I'm just gonna go in all in on this. Another Another thing that helped me was one day my granddad asked me and my mom and my aunt to come over to help him with something. And he said, he had this big block machine thing. I'm like, what the hell is that? He said, don't touch that. That's my miner. It's going to mine me some Bitcoin. And my granddaddy had to be like mid eighties at the time. No, excuse me, maybe early eighties, but anyway, he was 80 something years old. I'm just like, what the hell? So I looked it up and it was really legit. And I remember my my family telling me my dad, my granddad was always into early investments. 
the only thing he did was he sold them too early. You know, he 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 sold them too early. I think he got into Microsoft early. Uh, he got into he could have had like franchises of enterprise very early on, and you know that was very major back in his time when those things were out. But he sold them all too early. Um, so that let me that let me know that okay, Bitcoin is something real, and when people weren't paying attention to it, I was. Um, I first bought my my Satoshis at 626 USD Bitcoin. That's a figure we will never see again. <laughs> um, I rolled through the block size wars with Bitcoin. I rolled through the net neutrality scare that was supposed to be a thing. Um, ordinals, <laughs> congested networks, FTX. No matter what it is, you know, like I've 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 been through it all. Um, I've seen all the, I've seen the game so far that could be played in Bitcoin, Roger Veer, you know, all those guys. So, um, yeah, it was. It's been a, it's been an incredible ride at this point. And what led me to write the book was really COVID. Um, like during COVID, you know, the world was upside down, and Bitcoin then had taken the one of the greatest dips of all time. But during that time, I was driving DoorDash, and I was just like, man, not again, not again, not again. So while I was driving DoorDash, I wrote, I was uh, transcribing my book. I would just record it, say what happened, and then put it on paper. I mean, put it on the drive, or put it on the uh, Google Drive. Um, but the book was really meant just to tell my story. I, I know, like you say, I got to I gotta tell people who I am every time I'm in the room. But the book allowed me to have something out there that'll last forever, uh, something that people can, you know, stumble across on Amazon. Like, what is this about? We never heard of this book. We never heard. Of, we never heard of this guy. You know, who is this guy? Um, and it was also designed to give other people hope. You know, to let them know, like, you you can come out of any dark scenario, prison, um, depression. It doesn't really matter. You can get out of anything and, and you know, find light. It, we hope that it could be Bitcoin, but it might not be Bitcoin. Um, but it just tells a life story. And then at the very end, I really get into the Bitcoin stuff. But um, that's the that's the I guess the accelerated version of what brought me here. I picked up some of this looking at, you know, doing my doing the most homework I could do before we hopped on today. And one of the things I didn't find was the influence that your grandfather had on your overall experience getting into Bitcoin. And my grandfather, who passed many years ago now, when I was a kid, one of the things that he always did, and I've never shared this actually on mic, so it was kind of fun, he collected coins. So he had books and books of coins. Mm -hmm. And he passed and he left that basically to myself and my sister. And I've taken those coins since, and I've tried to keep his legacy going by selling some of those coins and putting it into Bitcoin. Yeah. So, cause I see it as a rarity, you know, he was collecting coins literally from like the civil war and stuff, super cool stuff. So it's interesting to see how the generational effects and impacts of looking for scarcity, because, you know, if your grandfather got into Microsoft early, that's crazy. And I think that older generations maybe used to be more into the idea of scarcity than maybe our generation is. Mm -hmm. But when we come across it, like you sound like you had your epiphany moment, your come to Satoshi moment. And I know I did too. I wasn't in at 626 like you were. I, I was in around 5,000 in 2017. I went to an ATM. I had physical fiat and I put it in and I scanned a code and I was like, oh, this is different. Something about this <laughs> is different. Um, but it's interesting to hear that from you. So thank, thank you for sharing that, that part of your story. And one of the one of the things that that kind of stuck out when I watched the mini documentary that Will actually put together, and I want to shout out Will. Will, thank you for putting that together. I know he supported you massively, and thank you for giving that love to Compass because, you know, Compass is here for that stuff. And there's a lot of stories that Compass maybe hasn't told that we need to start to tell, and a lot of that pressure maybe is on me, and I like that because there's so many things happening in Bitcoin. So it's great to have you on specifically today to talk about your experience. Um, where are you currently now? Are you in Charlotte? Yeah, I'm currently at a WeWork in Charlotte, North Carolina. But yeah, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Nice. And you're from Charlotte, right? Yes, sir. Born and raised. 
Okay, so Charlotte has blown up since COVID. A lot of things have changed since COVID, as we've kind of you know talk, talked about here. You were able to drive around and deliver food to people, probably as a first responder, so you were able to work and then put your voice into the into the cloud to you know put the book together. I want to ask, in strict curiosity here, what is Charlotte's Bitcoin? environment like feeling like because every big city has their meetups and stuff and i know nothing about charlotte bitcoin so we're kind of changing it's a hard a hard direction from where i thought we were going to go but now i'm just like hey i want to ask what is going on in charlotte with bitcoin and how have you been able to kind of like insert yourself as i think a leading voice in the space well um i'll tell you the truth we they we have a charlotte meetup group called bitcoin charlotte um we just crossed 300 members on telegram and to be quite frank with you, I'm I'm not the the biggest uh like I don't I don't go to all the events sometimes and um but I, I'm a great supporter of them um the the and it's a growing it's a growing scene. Charlotte is a city filled of real estate, bankers, uh, construction and healthcare. So tech tends to take a back seat. But I have a very, a very, a very funny story. So the founder of Bitcoin Charlotte, um, he's on, I think it's Jacob Knight on Telegram. I'm gonna tell you how I came across him though. So in 2016, I was on this app called Mycelium and Mycelium had a marketplace and you could try to buy Bitcoin from people peer to peer. So I see this guy on there named Bitcoin Charlotte what the hell? Who is this guy? So I messaged him and he said, yeah, you know, I think I bought like 20 bucks to, to try it out. Um, and we met like at this random park. Like, I don't even know where it is now because they probably built something on top of it. But we met at this random parking lot and I had bought Bitcoin for him a few times before, you know, the fans tried to say it was illegal. And... And that it had been like several years since I saw him, but the next time I saw him was at Bitcoin Twenty One in Miami, and he was at the uh, the three point contest. So um, Bitcoin Charlotte's always been good to me, though. They'll they'll invite me out to do some talks there. I've gone to a few of their meetups. They supported me with a book uh, a book drive. So Bitcoin Charlotte is a great community, and they're they do their best to build Bitcoin awareness throughout Charlotte. Thank you for sharing that. I, I'm always interested to see how Bitcoin latches on and where it plays a role in cities. And you're right. When I think of Charlotte, and especially my cousin lives there now, I think of more traditional business models, healthcare, which is now traditional in the United States, construction, as you talked about. And so there, you know, it's interesting to think about how Bitcoin fits in that. Uh, my cousin, who's 27, who's 10 years younger than I am, I just aged myself, which is fine. He's still <laughs> weary about Bitcoin. You know, I think he's got a little bit, but I'm like, hey, man, you know what? I, you know, he's got like maybe one or two percent. I'm like, hey, maybe we should expand that because when it <laughs> blows up, I don't want to be the one like people are going to be like, dude, look at your cousin. He's on everywhere talking about Bitcoin. How did you not listen to, you know, so yeah, yeah. It, it is interesting to think that I think Charlotte's a, a unique space in the sense there's more traditional business models. And so Bitcoin, I, that's why I was really curious, honestly. Yeah. Um, you You talked about, you know doing some stuff related to the book. And I want to make sure that we, we, we talk about this, that we have recently compass has collaborated and we've got, uh, you know, the donation of 40 copies to a correctional facility, I believe in Houston. Can you talk about what, what that looks like and start to get into how you're leveraging your book to make change? Cause like you said, your book is going to live forever and there's nothing better since ancient history, I think as a proof of work than a book. Yeah. Right. Once it's written, obviously the print and press helps to like keep that going. Right. But talk to me about that, that donation and some of the other stuff you've used to leverage the book to change lives. Well, yeah, first, yeah, let's great shout out to Compass Curtis, Mr. Curtis Harris. That was, that was amazing. Um, I think the books should be delivered today. So on Clubhouse, I was a part of a group called Black Bitcoin Billionaires. And, uh, you know, Clubhouse was, the thing, the audio app, great, whatever, whoever invented that, great job. Uh, but from there, you know, we would just be talking every day. And, you know, I said, well, I wanted to start a room for people who were, you know, formerly incarcerated. They were families, organizations, or you might even be in prison. And so I would just go on Clubhouse Mondays at eight o'clock. 
and I would have these rooms from bars to Bitcoin. And I would tell my story. I would have a few people come on to share their stories. And I would have uh, some guys I knew who were financially educated. Like they probably worked in, you know, different financial companies, but they really were Bitcoiners at the core to help understand not just what Bitcoin was, but what money was not and how people, uh, how chasing money, chasing fiat will lead you to do dumb shit. Um, there was this one great, this one great quote we did. This guy named Todd, Todd had done 30 years from like 18 to 48. And so I asked, I asked Ryan, I said, you know, Ryan, what was the price? What was the value of a dollar in what? 89. And he was like, Oh, it was like 90 some cents. Maybe, you know, give or take a few. By the time Todd came home, it was like down to 84 cents. And so that was a, a direct data-driven correlation that going to prison behind money makes zero sense. You're actually going in the negative. You lose time of your life. And then the money that most people in America go to prison over will lose value as you sit in prison. So you don't, it doesn't give you the the um the benefit you think it should. You know, it's it's like crime never pays, basically. And so when I made that correlation, I was like, all right, well, I want to take this, I want to bring this to people physically, not just on the app. And what I noticed, uh, I had I had even been invited to the um to the Bitcoin Academy that was created by Jack Dorsey and Jay-Z. And I would talk to people. I would always talk to people on the grounds about Bitcoin. Some people that I, I coached or I, or I, I educated, because I would talk to people who probably who aren't millionaires or thousandaires probably. And so their main thing was like, well, I love the the concept of Bitcoin, but I don't have a job. I don't have the money. I don't have the means to think about how can I buy this on a regular basis. And you know, I had to meet people where they were. I was just like, damn. You know, like I don't really want people to be out here saying I can't buy Bitcoin because I don't have a job. But that's the reality of where we are in America. So I was like, all right, how do you get people jobs? I'm like, well, shit. Um, I don't know, but just because you don't know, that don't mean you can't find the an answer. So one day, I um, so at the clubhouse was over, I was thinking about how can I make this project something real by at least going inside prisons and talking to people or educating people about Bitcoin. And so um, I knew it was going to be called From Bars to Bitcoin. And I had a friend on the app called, her name was Dr. Stacy Boyle. And she was just like, well, you might want to try this. You might want to try different methods. You might need to go become a nonprofit or LLC. And we were just trying to figure it out. So one day I was on LinkedIn, just networking meeting people in the correctional space, meeting people in the Bitcoin space. And I ran across this guy named Brian Cohen. He was in Arizona. And he said, yeah, you know, um, I don't mind talking to you about corrections and how to get into corrections, but there is a guy I want uh, I want to ask you if you knew by the name of Gideon Powell. I said, um, never heard of him. He said, he's out of West Texas and, you know, he has an oil company. He, you know, he inherited an oil and energy company and, He's a big Bitcoiner, da da this. And I was like, well, I'll look for him. So I looked for him on Twitter. I didn't see him. And then I looked for him on t- uh, link on, t- on Twitter, now X, and I saw he was already following me. So then I, I messaged him and he was like, you know, hey, I'm having, I'm, I'm, having, I'm having a conference in Houston. Would you be able to come? I was just like, no, not really. I'm not able to make it. Um, but he ended up buying a ticket and uh, flying me out there. So I, I went down there and met him. I was invited to his rooftop party. And that's where I met one of uh, one of my good partners, Jose De Hoyas. But what actually led this to be in the thing was I had gone to a, a, a session that was led by Dennis Porter and Chad Everett and Maximum. These were two different CEOs. And they were saying, we need people to work. We need people to, <clears throat> we need people to work on these mining sites these mining construction development sites, repair sites. And I was just like, all right, that sounds cool. So then they went to the VIP booth and I was just like, so who are you all against hiring? They're like, well, we're we're not against hiring anybody. Like, all right, well, I've heard this before, but let's see, you know, how 
how true this is. So I told them who I was. I ran down the same spiel, and they were they seemed to be interested. But uh, the most interested person at that conference at that time was Jose De Hoyas. And um, a guy who used to work there, Neil, Neil told me, Neil Galloway, he said, man, you might want to turn this into a nonprofit because I think a lot of people will help you a lot more if you make it a community-based thing as opposed to a, you know, competition type of thing. I was like, all right. So we spun up the nonprofit very quickly, probably by, no, that was in March. May 12th, 2023, we had our, um, we were incorporated. We're still waiting over our seal of approval from the IRS, which is kind of crazy, but I heard this takes a while. Um, but from there, you know, we created a nonprofit called Bitcoin Transformation Community. And our very first cornerstone project was the From Bars to Bitcoin uh, reentry uh, workshop tour. And, um, you know, from there, we started putting the word out. We got a grant from Geyser, uh, one on some of their grants. And we also received a, a very great grant from Block. And so once we got those off the ground, we were then able to go into, um, we went to a total of what, six different facilities as between, split up between prisons and transitional houses. Um, in the month of April, I had gone from Denver hosted a workshop in Denver at a recovery center in Denver, Flint, Michigan, and California. And earlier earlier this year, I had gone to Dallas and uh, Maryland in September of 23. So um, the, the, the way that the book was leveraged differently was to actually go inside of prisons and teach Bitcoin, uh, host a workshop. And then from there, I also introduced Jose who was able to give life and hope to people like, yeah, there's a, there's, there's light at the end of this tunnel here better than others. Um, with Bitcoin, we all know it's, uh, it's disruptive. And the thing about de being disruptive is it's not a lot of, a lot of, uh, red tape along the way. And again, the same thing is like, if you have the knowledge, you have the skills, people have to, they have to look at you. They got to take you serious. And, one more thing was like it's tech, it's fintech. So there is very little barrier of entry with Bitcoin, but there's a different pay in Bitcoin that I always noticed. Like I've always noticed that. And I think um, when I noticed that, that's when I was like, well, there's a pool of people in America who have gone to jail or prison who can't get jobs. And re recidivism is something that is always going to be taxing on the American dollar. So what's the best way to try to, you know, alleviate that as much as put this pool of what we like to call stranded human energy and put them into the stranded energy of Bitcoin that has a vacuum that where, where people can work, have these skills at the very, at the very, the very entry point of some type of a repair technician or general technician and grow your way from there. Um, so that's how the book was leveraged. And in Houston, it was a transitional house uh, by the name of Kobe House. And um, what we're going to do there, we're looking, that's where we look to implement phase two of the From Bars to Bitcoin um, reentry. One of the things that it made me think about was I'm currently up in Massachusetts, but, but most time I do live in South America. I live in Bogota. And people in Bogota are wildly aware of Bitcoin. And part of that is because there's a lot of Venezuelans now living in Colombia and Venezuelans have PhDs in currency devaluation. But one of the things that I, yeah. And one of the things for, for better or worse, that's the PhD they got. Yeah. But one of the things that I'm constantly aware of is the way that if you look at Bitcoin Twitter, for example, mm -hmm. and somebody will say Bitcoin fixes this Bitcoin fixes very few things perceptively for a small amount of people, I think, but it's applicable to anyone, which is an interesting thing if it's new money. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've run into the same thing where it's like, yeah, man, I, I would love to buy Bitcoin, but I don't even have a job. I can't pay rent. I can't buy food. I can't do, I can't get transport and I can't get medicine or I can't take care of a loved one that I have. And 
that is always really tough. And I think it, it always kind of resituates the, the, the conversation. So I'm really glad that you've looked at that and you said, okay, how can we get people money so they can cover their needs and then start to, you know, really take part in what the Bitcoin network is. There's many ways to do that. Right. But I love that you've tapped into mining. Obviously here we are <laughs> compass mining. And I think that that's really cool too, because everyone that works at compass and I, I feel I can say this confidently, they weren't always in Bitcoin. It's so new. Yeah. Before they were here, they were likely doing something different. You know, some of the biggest people in our company, when you look at their CVs, there there's not a one to one. This wasn't a, a round peg in a round hole. It's a square peg in a round hole, but it fits because Bitcoin like can evolve to people's skill set, which I think is a really cool thing. And so what I wanted to ask you was when you're given these workshops and you're talking to people who are either in transitional homes or you're going into an actual uh, facility, what are some of the, besides the, yes, maybe the barrier of, Hey, I don't have that money right now. What are some of the other questions or challenges that are kind of put up to you? And I don't want to call it FUD narratives, but what are some of the barriers to people's mindset change. Cause I, I think that this, this is constantly evolving the barriers. Um, and I'm always interested to, to learn from others what they are. And then the tough part is how are you getting past those barriers and being able to, to talk to people, you know, on a, on a, on a, we're on the same page basis. You will be amazingly shocked to find out that the barriers they have in prison are the same barriers they have coming out of corporate America about Bitcoin. It's the, like, it's, they might not sound the same, but they're the same. Oh, who's the creator? How can we trust this? Uh, where did that come from? It sounds, it sounds scammy. You know, like the barriers or someone, cause, cause when you start thinking like you, you hear in Bitcoin, you start hearing a lot of pro, uh, data about the number of people in this country with financial literacy and like, if they say like only 27% of people are financial literate, that, that includes people who work in a boardroom and people who sit in a day room in a prison. Uh, so the, so the questions sound the same. And a lot of the questions are based upon fear of something new. Um, you have, you have that small, that one person who's going to jump straight in and, you know, say, I don't care on day one, you got somebody who's going to take about six months. You got someone who's going to take about 18 months. Then you got people around the decade, you know, to take a while. Um, so it comes down to to not even knowing what money is, you know. And one of the things that we help, that we do to help, you know, overcome that barrier or turn that light switch on is to show what inflation is, show what control is, and in prison, you know, again, most people in prison are sitting in prison behind money, uh, whether they had to rob, steal, kill, scam for it between like a drug dealer or a birdie made off. You know, they all trying to go to prison behind money and you sit in prison. The longer you sit down there, the worse the money gets. So some of the things we would do is I would show people the price of stamps. Uh, sometimes you have guys in there who've been locked up for like 20 years. So they remember when stamps were what, 15 cents, 20 cents. And now I'd be like, you know, how much are you paying for stamps now? Well, I'm paying like 66 cents for a stamp, you know? And uh, how how that barrier would work is, I was like, all right, so with the stamps here, imagine you having a stamp that has a number on it. That stamp is now deemed, that's the worth of that stamp forever. But when you add forever to the stamp and it increases in value, you can always use this whatever. I said, look at the forever stamps like Bitcoin and look at the number of stamps like regular currency. And so then it was just like, wow. So, you know, mm -hmm. are you saying the longer I hold it, you know, the more value it gets? I was like, that's what the data has been saying. I don't know what it's going to be moving forward, but that's what it says right now. Um, but then, you know, we take the part of, you know, the value going up. And now when it's talking about like currency, like it's a currency, a medium of exchange. People are like, what do you mean? I can, I can, I can buy something with this. I can buy something with that. I'm like, yeah. So in prison, you know, you use tobacco, you use snacks, deodorant, shoes, whatever is going to be the mean, the means of currency. Is that's what it's going to be, and it's agreed upon. I said, so it's going to always be something agreed upon, even with Bitcoin. If I'm selling the car for two thousand USD, but I'm willing to take eighteen hundred in BTC, 
and you come over here with eighteen hundred or seventeen ninety nine, I'm going to take that because we agree upon that. So it's about you know understanding how agreements and these medium of exchanges work, and then um, you know the decentralization part and the decentralization that happens in prison was what I realized. And granted, they don't use like I learned they don't use stamps anymore in prison. They all have tablets and uh that's that was a whole different thing. Um but in prison, you know, when when I was in prison we had stamps and so let's say I had money on my card, but I can only use forty dollars a week or I could put it I could be put on a limit, a limit of what I could spend if I get in a write up or something. But if I have stamps, as long as the guards don't take the stamps, I can always use them to do business. So I said, thinking of ways of like, you know, the IRS might shut your bank account down, but you have like 100000 in Bitcoin to still be able to do business with. So I gave those three scenarios and um, those help, you know, meet people where they are. And again, most of the question you have, you even, and I remember I was in Colorado you had a lot of people who knew something about finances. They knew about appreciation. They knew about uh, they knew about investing. But when it came down to Bitcoin, I think the thing that really will get the people is like, it's not government issued, you know. And so if it's not government issued, then they start realizing, you know, either I a don't know as much as I thought I knew, or b I actually trust this government more than I didn't know that I trusted them. And so now you now you start unraveling things and, and people start, you know, coming a little bit more um aware of how of how Bitcoin works and how money doesn't work. That's the main thing of uh the first half of the workshop is all about showing how money does not work. And then we go into, you know, what Bitcoin does and how Bitcoin does work. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think for me, Bitcoin was a huge part of my financial literacy journey because I've had mentors since 2014, 2015 talking to me about how to build wealth, uh, financial freedom, financial independence, the FIRE community and all these things and dividends. And when I looked at the stock market, it never really made sense to me. I also didn't feel like when I was around those conversations, there were spaces where I personally felt comfortable. Mm -hmm. You don't see like where I was. Like when I think about the New York Stock Exchange, I'm not thinking about like a bunch of Latinos hanging around talking about it. So I didn't see myself in those spaces. But then when I got into Bitcoin, it just kind of made sense. Uh, technically, it was just easier for me to kind of wrap my head around. So it's interesting to know that your curriculum also starts with a not only what is money, but what isn't money. Because in our society, these are constantly uh, misconstrued, um, ideas. And so I think that that's, that's amazing. And what I wanted to, and, and you had mentioned the financial literacy as being a big part of some of the work you're doing both in facilities and in transition homes and building on that between the work in facilities and transition homes. Before we hopped on mic, I actually reached out to Will Foxley who did the mini documentary. I'm going to keep calling that out. The descriptions below, uh, the link is in the description below. Please go watch that. It's about eight minutes. It's amazing. And I said, Will, I'm going to have Justin on the podcast. Would you mind sending me a question that you want me to ask him? So Will hit me back and he said the following. I'm going to read it verbatim uh, so I don't miss, you know, I don't miss uh, misquote Will. He said, mostly curious just what his end goal is with prison education. Is it post-incarceration for some of these people uh, he's working with? Like he's doing a great job educating people in prison, but is there anything for them once they're back in society? And now this is me talking the transition coming back into society, you've talked about recidivism. That seems to be one of the biggest challenges, right? And then he says, seems like a cool opportunity for a Bitcoin company to help out. I don't know if that's a tip for Compass or anyone else listening, but talk to us about the transition out. It's something you did and you know how high recidivism is. What are the parts? And you've also teased this, and I don't know if you want to share, but you've teased uh, the second part of the workshop. I assume that that has to do with the... Now that you're out, let's stay out. Here are some steps. Here are some goals. Here are some things to think about. Here's a mindset shift that worked for me, maybe. Uh, if you could talk about that, that would be great. And thank you, Will, if you're listening to this, for your for your question. Man, Will, as always, Will has the greatest questions ever. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's, I never wanted this just to be a one-time thing. I've always noticed with Bitcoin in general that a lot of people are just, one and done. So like 
one I did this one cool thing. I'm on to try to do some another cool thing and not really build more value on top of it. So um within that, matter of fact, where the where you all where companies donate the books. What we want to do at the Kobe House is create a well even any transitional center or any anywhere that's that's um available. But we're gonna first do it at the Kobe House. What we wanna do is provide minor repair training, something very easy. Kind of, well, I don't want to say easy, but something simple for you to get into, something that you can see um, some employment behind, some type of money behind. Uh, so with with Jose De Hoyas, the CEO of LFG, they actually have a training curriculum where they teach people how to repair ASIC generators, how to work on those sites. They give skills to to go from, I think it's like, what, level one technician, level two, uh, three, board, general. And so within that, basically, it's one person gets out of prison. So we we have what we call our, our learning journey. The workshop takes place, which was phase one. We went to different prisons in different states. Some of those states were Bitcoin mining friendly. Some weren't. Um, but... The thing is, we want to now move folks towards either like some training at like their local transition house or Jose and LFG. They have a, a mobile 40 foot uh, trailer that they can move around the country and train people on. So the training doesn't take long. Um, but then once someone goes through that training, they get the certifications from LFG. They have the skills. What we have now is we work, we also have partnerships with the Bitcoin talent company to where we will try to plug those individuals in. So, um, and one thing I learned in Texas was they might not even actually work on the mining site. This one guy, he pulled up to Forgiven Felons. We were in Dallas. He said, you know, he said, I'm gonna tell you why I'm here. Um, one day I was delivering a job and it had all these ASICs on. He didn't even know they were ASICs. He said, what the hell are these? And so then he said, he went to like a, a a container, a big mining container out in the middle of Texas. He said some people opened the door. He said it was kind of eerie at first. He said he saw all these miners just lined up. He didn't even know what he was dropping off. So like there's a lot of different um there's a lot of different ways to contribute to the space by not just working on a mining site. But to answer that question for Will uh, that's our phase two. So the phase two of the, the From Bars to Bitcoin program is to, number one, create that standalone training um, that people can come inside. Like when they get out of prison, you can go to like, let's just say Kobe House in Houston for right now. You can go there. You can learn these skills. They can either A, repair them at the transitional house or they get hired on by somebody to then go and work and do those repair technicians. Uh, do, those, do those repairs. And then um, from there, what what is our ultimate goal? We also want to do some recordings. We want to be able to record this training. We want to be able to have it live digitally so um, you can learn it abroad across the country. But more importantly, you can actually learn this inside prisons. So the second phase, like we're not actually looking to leave from going in prisons, but not so much physically. So they have these tablets in certain prisons called Securus tablets. And we, we're open for, we definitely need some uh, donations to put this together. But what we want to do, we want to record the trainings. We want to be able to record just traditional Bitcoin education, but also like mining repair technician job qualification uh, trainings. So you can have it on your tablet. So when someone is sitting in their bunk or their cell or whatever, they can actually follow this along and have that knowledge of how to do so, of what to do when they get out. You get out, you still might have to get your hands, you don't have to get your hands dirty because you just can't, there's no way to mentally prepare yourself for what you have to do physically. Um, but then move folks along, it's like a conveyor belt. You're here, you're learning it inside, you're able to conceptualize what it is mentally. You get out, then you're able to you know, physically get your hands on what it is that companies would be looking for. And then by then, we work with Talico, Bitcoin Talent Company, or if we, you know, everybody has connections, Compass might hire people. But uh, from there, 
what we're able to do is get people employed. Um, and there's another phase of this that is still working with cross this working with corrections is not like working with a corporation. You will be on their time and you're going to stay on their time if you want to uh, do something with them. And that's just it. So you got to have like an enormous amount of patience. You might not hear back from people for months and they have a valid reason why. Uh, but that's just that, that feel. But there's a, there's a, a prison out in Sterling, Colorado called Sterling Correctional Institution. I mean, Sterling Correctional Facility. And some of their residents have said, hey, we want to try to mine the Bitcoin here. We want to try to learn these skills here. Now, Colorado had to be the most progressive. This is not even going to go together. The most progressive prison system I've ever seen. Like, don't even sound right. But we go in there and I'm just, I go, like, I actually walk the yard. I'm in people's dorm rooms, the day rooms, sitting down with them. And in a certain part of the prison, they're playing video games, Madden. I'm like, what the hell? Y'all got video games? And it's like a whole open-minded concept. Like, Sterling was once a very dangerous prison. And so uh, mm -hmm. some of the guys there, they were like, yeah, man, you know, we want to put a proposal together to try to get a mi some mining rigs out here. I actually talked to Curtis about it. And he said, you know, if, if everything can get passed on their end, I told him, like, I know people crazy enough to try this shit, man. Um, and that'll be that'll be a scenario where you have people learning skills in the prison, hands on, to then come home and have this skill and, you know, shop their skills around different places. So the, the gist of it isn't just to go inside and, and, and provide education on Bitcoin, which is great, but... It's meant to get people employed because more times than not, people come home with no money. Um, as a grown adult, you the average income for someone with a record coming home is twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a year. So with that type of money, you're asking people to go to what they think works but doesn't work. You're asking them to to be grown grown adults working for. 18 and 19 year olds at some type of restaurant or something, you know, and it's not really giving people much dignity and pride. So, um, at the very, like I tell people, like, I'm not sitting here guaranteeing you, you will be rich by no means necessary. You will have to work. There will be no free lunch in this, but you know, you can provide for you. If you have a family, you can contribute, you know, um, you work hard enough. You might be, you know, the breadwinner of the household. But you will be eventually, as long as you understand what Bitcoin is, as well as how you work, where you work. Um, so the that's not the end point. That's not the end goal neither. But the goal is to definitely now within phase two, um, be able to get that training off the ground so that can live forever as well. So people can then move towards getting employed and, and um, you know, seeing the next phase of that change for themselves. Well, that sounds amazing. And I feel like you may know a company that's just crazy enough to consider that. That's all I'll say. Thank you for talking about uh, shouting out probably Andy Thompson and the other people over at the Bitcoin talent company. Andy was just on actually with Curtis and uh, did an amazing episode. I'll also link that below. I want to respect your time. We're coming up on the hour where I know you got things to do in Bitcoin and lives to change here. So I want to give you that moment to share where people can find you. Uh, is it LinkedIn? Is it Twitter? Should they just go to the Bitcoin uh, transformation website? Where are the places where if someone's listening and they want to reach out or they want to support you? I know you're still waiting on your 501c3 status, but maybe there's a company that wants to send you some sats for all the work you're doing. Where are the best places for them to find you? Uh, well, yeah, like you said, the very first place first is the btctc.org. Um, you can check out our website there. We're going to post some more of our progress there. Um, we do have, we do, we do take donations in sats, of course. I don't think it would be right if we didn't. Uh, we also take USD, you know, whatever one you want to hand over, that's cool. Um, uh, we're on X or Twitter, uh, just Bitcoin transformation community. And we are at our pinned tweet. You'll see our impact summary for the first half for phase one of our, of our uh, tour. Um, we're also on LinkedIn. 
And I'm on LinkedIn as Justin Redrick. I'm on Twitter as Bitcoin underscore vegan. But the the you know the nonprofit is what we're, what we're pushing. And our mission statement and vision is all on our website. Um, you know, if you hear this and you feel inclined to send some sats, please do. Um, please do. Don't don't try to give your sats to something. Uh, <laughs> I hate to say this. Something that you think gonna make more money than having it in Bitcoin. Don't don't get swindled in to doing something crazy. You know, you got some sats or some Bitcoin you want to donate to a just cause that shows their proof of work, that actually does what they said they're gonna do, no matter how it goes now. Um, we're that we're that organization for you. Um and yeah, just continue checking out everything we're doing. We 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 love compass mining, hell. You know, like Compass, Compass has been there. It, I, I gotta say it. I, I don't. I remember when Will, um, you know, things were going down, how they went down in twenty three, and Will was like, "Man, you know, I know you might not want to, you know, be associated with us." I said, "Will, I'm a felon in America, and this is bear market shit, bro. Like, it's <laughs> let's just keep going. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes you gotta understand that you gotta roll with punches." And that's just it. Um, but yeah, please support the nonprofit, man. Like we're, we're if you even if you want to volunteer your time, we're open for like people who are great in marketing, social media, uh, grant writers, anything. This this is a cause to help alleviate recidivism. It's not just to to go and, and talk about this cool stuff on on money we're making, but we're not making a change. You know, this is what we stand for, and we're looking for people who understand like the work, the work is work. Uh, you might not feel like you're getting paid your quote unquote worth at the present moment, but you'll see the value you put out there into the world and you know that it gets greater later. I'll say that it gets greater later. This, this isn't necessarily about making money. You know, this is about giving that opportunity for everybody to, to see, you know, one thing I wanted to do before I go, like how you said earlier, people say Bitcoin fixes this, Bitcoin fixes that, but like Bitcoin itself does not. Like, I just can't throw some sats in prison and be like, here, save the world. You know, it's the people here who will help. It's it's being, it's thinking in different ways. Um, yeah, we all want to make money. We're not gonna not gonna play around like that, <laughs> you know. But like, there are people out there who are brilliant people. Brilliant people who need opportunities. You know, they need somebody to take a chance on. And uh, we're willing to take that chance if uh, people are willing to take that chance on us. And we'll have our proof of work to show everywhere we've gone and how we've done what we do. So, yes, sir. Just check us out. BTCTC.org. We're on Geyser. And uh, check us out on, 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 on X or Twitter, whatever one you like to call it. Justin, that's great. I'm going to add all the links you just shouted out in the uh, episode's description, so make sure you check that out. And once again, there will be the mini documentary that Will Foxley helped put together uh, that outlines Justin's entire story. Please check it out. That's also in the description. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're listening to us on a podcast platform, please go ahead and subscribe. Follow us on X, Twitter, uh, and LinkedIn, and YouTube at Compass Mining. And Justin, this has been an absolute pleasure and there's a lot of connectivity between Compass and what you're doing, so I'm sure that we will be creating more content in the future. Um, but thank you for your time today. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, man.